All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to Onward. We're glad you're here. And uh, we know that where two or three come together, Jesus said, there I am in their midst. So we are here. We are the presence of the Lord Jesus is among us. And uh, we welcome those gathered online to watch the service and participate in that way. We pray that you'll be blessed and encouraged. I'm just going to open in a word of prayer and commit this time to the Lord and uh, invite him to work in our hearts as well. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the, the gift of music, the worship that we can sing and praise your name. Thank you for the worship team this morning that's prepared these songs. Thank you for those who are on the sound, who have prepared the slides, for those who are helping to run the, the PowerPoint and the live stream and all these technology things that make it possible to hear and see. And I pray that you would, uh, worship, you would help us, Lord, as we worship you. You would help us to, to draw closer to you. And that we would, uh, in our hearts, uh, know your presence, your love, and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite Emily and the team up to uh, play and sing and, and lead us this morning in these worship songs. Good morning. You may rise and join us for worship. Shout the hymn of 
Praise to 
to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily So much at this point, the children up to well, five to 12 can head for Awana, head back and down the stairs. And uh, if there's any little learners, the two to four year olds, you can come out this way for your class as well. And uh, I'm gonna invite Ray up to come give us a few announcements. Morning. Morning. Morning to you at home. Uh, I trust that uh, you will be blessed this morning as we worship together and as we uh, allow God to speak to our hearts. We, we need to be spoken to from time to time. And what a better place than to be here and listen to a message that will have impact on our lives. A few announcements. There's a membership class this Tuesday at 7 o'clock. This is Tuesday the 28th via Zoom. So you'll be very comfortable and spend a lot of time talking about membership. Uh, if you want to uh, know more about being a member at Onward, uh, you can call Pastor Russ or Pastor Brian. 
There will be a baptismal service on April the 2nd. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you desire to be baptized, make it known to our pastors. And uh, I'm sure they'll uh, make arrangements to sit you in on the class before baptism. And uh, you'll, uh, you'll enjoy the experience of declaring yourself belonging to the Lord as you are baptized. I remember when uh, my wife was baptized, I wasn't the believer. And I dropped her off and I, she said, would you come in? And I said, no, I'm going to park out here and wait for you. Uh, but I decided, I don't know, I guess the Lord prompted me, go on in and see what goes on with these things. So I did. And I, I, I must tell you that it touched my heart. Uh, you can't, you can't avoid it. It's, uh, it's a blessed time, and uh, I'm, I'm glad I did. We are going to begin a Chinese fellowship. Isn't that great? With all of the Chinese people here in Verdun and around different little municipalities, and uh, Huing, uh, Yuing Ting. Well, I, I always have trouble with your name, you ain't ding. And, uh, and uh, Richard are the, in leadership of this, and uh, I know that they have a heart for the Chinese people and to bring them the gospel. So you be much in prayer for this. Pray for them that God will just uh, bring a revival of the Chinese people. This will be begin on April the 9th and the 23rd at 12.30 till 2.45. Uh, yeah. So anyways, if, uh, if you can remember to put that in your calendar to, to pray for them. Our weekly ministries, of course, uh, are always on Zoom with... Uh, Wednesday night, the Colossian Bible study with pastor, and on Thursday, the discipleship, uh, which uh, we are really enjoying some new people, and uh, God is blessing in a special way. And then you have Friday Youth and Sunday Awana. And be in prayer for these. Uh, they're all related into building one another up in the things of the Lord. Now, uh, because there were a couple of people that indicated to me that they would like to go uh, to attend a, a discipleship class, uh, that is the evangelism class, uh, we, we may have another one in mid-May. But if you're interested, we, we need to know as quickly as possible so that uh, we can... Uh, begin to make the plans, necessary plans for that. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and pray for the various needs of our church here. Loving Father, great news that we've received from David Nenskeville and the fact that uh, he's beginning to say a few words He's beginning to uh, uh, see with his eye. and Father, there, there are many things that are happening that are very positive for him, and I pray that the healing process will continue, that you will bring him totally healed of uh, his experiences. I also pray for Leif, Andre. Praise the Lord that... Uh, the, uh, the tumor, the lung tumor, has healed for him. And Lord, I pray that in the coming days and weeks that you would bless him in a special way. That uh, the Lord Jesus Christ would open the, the windows of heaven for him. I pray for 
uh, Violetta Reno, and she will be adjusting to a new home in Villa Sal. We've been praying about that, Lord, and we thank you that uh, you have made uh, available for her this new home. And I pray for Victoria and Nadia Zaborski's sister in the Ukraine, Lord. Uh, they need protection from the war, and especially as she battles with her, her MS. And Father, she has a loving Father who takes care of her, and I pray that you would give him strength and courage to continue. Father, I, I pray for his own health. And Father, that uh, soon we will see a, an end to this nonsense of the war in Ukraine. Thank you, God, that uh, you're in the process of healing Suzanne Labre and giving her strength in her legs. Lord, there are many health issues that she has to deal with, so I pray that you would minister to her in a special way. And for those that uh, are dealing with cancer, whether they be members of Onward or friends or relations, uh, those that we have been praying for, there are some with physical and also, God, with spiritual needs. We pray for them, as well as the caregivers that are involved in their lives. And Father, there are some uh, unspoken requests, and especially as we uh, remember our missionary missionary that we support. I pray, God, that you would keep him safe and any others that uh, are involved. And I pray, Father, this morning as Pastor opens the book of Revelation, that uh, you would help us to understand, get a glean of what the Word talks about and Father, I pray that uh, each one of us, as we leave this place, that we will have met with the Lord in a real sense, in a real way. I, under, I, I pray, Father, for Pastor, that the Spirit of God would uh, reveal through him some of the... Uh, the words in your, in your precious Bible that will enable us to press on in our lives. We thank you, God, for the offering and those that are uh, ushering. And I pray, Father, that uh, you would bless the offering and that it would, it would be well used. <clears throat> I thank you in the Lord's name. Amen. Amen. Ushers, come forward, please.
Our scripture reading today is from the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 1 to 15. And I saw an angel coming down out of the heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, and looked and sealed it over him, to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they, were, they are like the, the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I, then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. All right. I trust the microphone is on here. Can you hear me okay? There we go. Oh, perfect. And just going to plug this in here so you can see the screen. Those of you watching online, I trust you can also see uh, what will be displayed there behind me and on the screen in front of you. Well, in case you didn't figure it out, today we are looking and continuing the study on the book of Revelation. And we're talking today about the millennium and the final judgment. And um, in my recollection, I think this is the first time in my, um, my ministry as a pastor that I've actually preached on this, uh, this, exact, uh, this exact subject for an entire sermon. And so I'm really excited to uh, unfold and, and unpack this chapter, uh, this amazing chapter that, that actually tells us so much in the Bible. And so because I need, we all need God's Holy Spirit to, to show us his, from his word the things that he wants us to see, let's just pray and ask. Ask God to, to do that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that uh, you have revealed your word. You've revealed yourself to us in your word. And I pray that these truths and these principles, the, these wonderful things that we're going to read about today would uh, encourage our hearts, that they would inspire us to live more wholeheartedly for you, and that it would uh, give us a picture of what we can look forward to in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So, 
We were talking about the millennium and the final judgment. That's in the book of Revelation chapter 20. So you can turn there in your Bibles. And just to kind of set the picture here, before we dig into the actual passage uh, today, uh, there are essentially when theologians talk about the millennium. By the way, the millennium means a thousand years. Okay, so we're talking about a thousand year period, the millennium. And uh, when theologians talk about this, there's essentially three views about the millennium. Uh, let me just go from bottom to the top on this slide. And the first view is amillennialism. This view does not see the millennium as a future, literal 1,000-year reign on earth of Jesus. Rather, it is seen, this view sees it as a spiritual kingdom that refers to Christ's rule in the hearts of his people during the church age. And so the, the passage that we're going to look at today by a millennialist would see this as more of a uh, description of the age we are in. Jesus is reigning. And, and then this transitions to the new heaven, the new earth, Revelation 21. The second view that people have had over the past 2,000 years of church history is called post-millennialism. That's the, the middle one. And post-millennials, uh, they view, they see Jesus as coming back after the millennium, similar to the amillennial view. The, the millennium isn't seen to be a literal uh, thousand-year period and rather a long time. And so in the post-millennial view, the, the earth get, becomes more and more Christian uh, because it's the millennium, then Jesus comes back post, after the millennium. And then there's the third view, and, and that is the view that we hold as a church, Onward Gospel Church, and our association of churches, and it's my personal view as well, and that is called premillennialism. And premillennialism, this view sees Jesus coming back before pre-millennium, before a thousand years, and it is in this view, uh, the thousand-year reign is seen to be as a literal a thousand years, one thousand years of church of, of history, I should say, and it seemed to be a golden age upon the earth. In fulfillment of multiple prophecies in the Old Testament, where Jesus is said to reign over the earth as king and Messiah, and uh, for example, in this time period, uh, in the premillennial view, you have on the graph, you have the, the church age that we're in, uh, followed by uh, the rapture of the church. Jesus comes for the church and takes us to be with him. We're given brand new, resurrected, glorified bodies. Meanwhile, there's a, a tribulation that takes place upon the earth. Jesus talked about this in Matthew's gospel, and we've been talking about that in the book of Revelation. It's Daniel's 70th week. And it's a seven-year period of time divided into two periods, after which Jesus comes in power and glory, the second coming of Christ. And he will then uh, set up his millennial kingdom, this thousand-year reign upon the earth. And that is what we're going to look at in Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. After which Satan is loosed. We're going to talk about that. There's the great white throne judgment and the eternal state, the new heaven and the new earth. So this just gives you an overview. And uh, you are more than welcome to request these slides from me. And uh, I put these together and I can make them available to you as well. But first of all, in the millennial kingdom, just an overview. Sometimes people say, well, it's only taught in the New Testament. Actually, there's a lot of Old Testament passages that talk about a golden age upon the earth. For example, in Jesus will rule over the nations from Jerusalem, the world's largest capital. That's Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. Animals will no longer kill each other or humans in this period of time. It says the wolf and the lamb and the snake and the little child will play together. Well, that's not something that you usually see today, is it? Um, and so there seems to be this time upon the earth that, that is going to be a, a golden age. Um, it's going to be an age of righteousness and peace. Um, there will be no more war. In fact, it says that the weapons of war will be turned into agricultural tools. How amazing will that be? That people will lay down their weapons because Jesus will rule and reign. Acts, uh, Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4. As well, the earth will be exceedingly prosperous and fruitful again. Uh, uh, it's going to be an incredible time according to Isaiah 35. According to Revelation 20, the, those, the resurrected saints, uh, that is you and me as believers in Jesus, we will reign with Christ. This is, the, in fact, one of the most outstanding and incredible uh, prophecies that we see in the New Testament. And I'm going to explain more about that. And physical health and well-being will be the norm, leading to a longevity of life for all who are upon the earth um, in non-glorified bodies. And I'm going to explain that. 
Now, for the most part, Christians today tend to be pre-millennial in their belief or amillennial. The post-millennial view does not really, is not widely held anymore because there's a general recognition that things are getting, aren't getting more and more Christian in the world. Um, even though the gospel is spreading, it seems that the world is becoming less and less Christian, both in beliefs and in practice, and I think we'd all agree. Furthermore, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 uh, mentions a great apostasy and a falling, of a, a falling away from the faith that must happen before Christ returns on the earth. And so all that does not fit with the, with the, with the view, with the post-millennial view. And so uh, the post-millennial view, I believe, doesn't really hold any weight and uh, should be rejected. Now, I have a deep respect for those who hold a millennial view, uh, but I personally uh, hold the premillennial view as well as our church official doctrine, and uh, I'll share a couple of reasons why I believe the premillennial view to be the most to make the most sense of Scripture. Uh, one one reason to hold to the premillennial view, that is Christ coming back before the thousand year reign, is because the numbers and numerals mentioned in Revelation are more often than not to be taken literally. Let me give you some examples. Like we saw in Revelation chapter 6, there were seven sealed judgments, and then they were listed. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then the seventh is open, and the next thing starts. Uh, Revelation 8 and 9, there's seven trumpet judgments, and they were then listed. We also saw, saw seven bowl judgments. They were listed. And so we also saw that there's seven years of tribulation. We saw that uh, the, there's a part of that, there's three and a half years. And so all these uh, numbers and numer numerology are, are given in Revelation, and uh, most, most of the time, in fact, I would say almost all the time, they are to be taken literally. So that's just a, one thing. So then when we suddenly see a thousand-year reign, well, uh, based on how we've seen previous numbers used in Revelation, it makes sense to follow that logic and to also take it literally. I mean, if there's going to be a literal seven-year reign, a seven-year tribulation, then why wouldn't there be a literal 1,000 years reign if they're both in Revelation like that? The second reason to take it literally uh, is that there are Old Testament prophecies about a golden age on earth that don't seem to be describing the eternal state. Let me mention one of them. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 20 says, Never again will there be in it an infant who lives out but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. Amazing. The one who fall, fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. Now, I don't believe this can be speaking about the eternal state where we're, we're in, in, that we're going to see in Revelation 21. By the eternal state, by the way, I mean when the new heaven and the new earth are made, and it says there's no more death, there's no more disease, there's no more uh, suffering, and so on. And, uh, but here in Isaiah 65, it mentions that people still die. So it can't yet be the eternal state where nobody dies anymore, because, uh, and, and however, it's a unique time where a person who dies at the age of 100 is still considered to be dying young. Now, since the time of Isaiah, even up to this day, the average lifespan has been well under 100 years. But according to Isaiah, there's a golden age on the earth that's still future, where if somebody dies at 100, that will be considered dying young. You know, you know, today when somebody lives to 100, what do we say? We say, wow, they've had such a long life, right? But in the golden age, in this millennial age, when somebody dies at 100, they'll be saying, whoa, they died. So, you know, they're almost, it's, it's, it's like they're accursed. Like, how can that be that they could die at 100? And so it seems that, that the conditions of the earth, when Jesus rules and reigns, will be similar to, or the lifespans will be maybe similar to what they were pre-flood, before the flood, before, um, in the, you know, the days of Noah, before that, where there was longevity of life. It seems that things will return to something like that. And so... I believe, therefore, when you take passages like Isaiah 65 and verse 20, it must be fulfilled in an era that's different to our current age, and yet it's distinct and different from the eternal state. Therefore, the millennium. 
That's what I believe the millennium is. After Jesus returns, he's going to establish this earthly kingdom. It's not the eternal state, but it's a golden age compared to the present age that we live in. Now, let's look at Revelation 20 as we study God's word together. The first thing we're going to see is that Satan is bound at the beginning of the millennium. Look at verse 1 to 3 in chapter 20. It says, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who's the devil or Satan, and bound him for 1,000 years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years uh, reign, uh, sorry, thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Take note of that. So the first order of business in, when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom is to confine the evil one, Satan, the chief rebel, the, the instigator of all evil. And Satan is said to be bound for the millennium. Now, those who hold the amillennial view, who would see this passage as describing the present age, and so they interpret the binding of Satan as to what happened during Jesus' earthly ministry, when Jesus triumphed over Satan through his exorcisms and casting out demons. That's how they interpret it. However, I would say, and I hope you would agree, that it makes more sense to see the binding of Satan as occurring after Jesus returns to establish his earthly kingdom, because in the present church age, Satan does not appear to be bound or imprisoned. Right? I mean, he's freely roaming around the earth like a roaring lion. Like what Jesus, uh, the first Peter 5, 8 says, Be alert and be sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So this doesn't sound to me like Satan is bound presently. He seems freely, conf he's, free he's not confined, in fact, like this verse says. He's prowling, he's, he's, a, he's, on, he's on active duty. But at the beginning of the millennium, when Jesus returns in power and glory, what's going to happen is that Satan will be bound, as you can see on this chart, right at the beginning there, uh, underneath the word millennium, it says Satan bound. Now, this is not his final and eternal confinement in the lake of fire. We're going to talk about, see that later in this passage. But it's, it's called the abyss. He's put in the abyss, and that's kind of like a prison where Satan and, and, um, and his demons will be confined for this thousand-year reign. Now, notice the names of Satan. I just want you to see how the Bible mentions his name a few in these verse 2. I've underlined it. There's four different names given. First of all, you see the name the dragon. That's a title that's used about Satan in Revelation. We've already seen that before. Points to his cruelty. Um, we've also seen, and then it talks about that ancient serpent. Well, that's a title of Satan that, that goes back to what? The garden, in the Garden of Eden, right? Genesis 3, he appears to, in the, took, takes the form of a serpent when he tempted Adam and Eve. And then we see another term here, the devil. Well, that's another term that's used. In fact, the, the devil means, it means accuser. Accuser. Satan he likes to accuse you and he likes to accuse me. In fact, he accuses us with lies. He says things like, and maybe you recognize this voice, God doesn't love you. Your sin is too great for God to forgive you. You're a lost cause. You've, you've done too many bad things. How could God possibly still use you? You hear, you know, if, if you hear that, that voice, if, you, if those thoughts come to your mind, that's Satan. Satan. Because he's the accuser. Anytime you, you are accused uh, for your sin and stuff, that's Satan accusing you. Don't bother with God, Satan says. He doesn't care about you. Go ahead and sin. It doesn't really matter. So Satan is the accuser. And the way we, we handle those is we, we need to arm ourselves with the truth. God's word is like a sword that's truth. And it, it, it is able to counter those lies that Satan has. Now, the other name we see is Satan. Uh, Satan means adversary. Satan is opposed to God. He's against God. He's against Jesus. And he's against believers who are um, trust in Jesus. But yet one day, one day, this is incredible, one day God is going to judge Satan for all these crimes, all this tempting, lying, cheating, accusing, deceiving, and he's going to be found guilty. He's going to be put in this prison called the abyss for a thousand years. And during those thousand years, he won't be able to deceive people. 
Uh, and now this doesn't mean that people living during the millennium will be unable to sin, because part of the population of the millennium, um, born of believers who entered, who go into the millennium, um, they will. Uh, we're going to see here at the end of the millennium. There's going to be a, this up, uprising, this rebellion. Okay, I'm going to get to that. But let's just say, let's begin here with the second point. Uh, not only is Satan bound at the beginning, now we see Jesus will rule and reign with the saints over the earth during the millennium. Uh, look, look real quick at verse 4 to 6. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. Well, that's interesting. Who's that a reference to? Who, who are on the thrones? Who are given authority to judge? Believers in Jesus. It's talking about the saved up until that moment who are given glorified, resurrected bodies before the millennium begins. They get to reign with Christ. Uh, now, let's keep reading. It says, I also saw in the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus, because of the word of God, they had not worshipped the beast or its image, had not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So we see here there's a group that are, are reigning with Christ, right? It says it. And now, who is, who is considered in that group? Well, if you were here last week, I talked about three, group, three, three groups of people who get to reign with Christ during the millennium. It, first of all, is the church, those believers who are from the church age, who uh, are saved, and they will be resurrected at the rapture, and they will be given glorified bodies, and will get to reign with Christ during the millennium. The second group is seen in Revelation 20 and verse 4. They are those who uh, went through, who are martyred during the tribulation. It says they had not worshipped the beast or its image, right? So they, they came to life, it says in verse 4 as well. So that's the second group, tribulation martyrs. And then there's a third group. Uh, we saw that in the passage in chapter 19. Uh, and also we see this in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, and that is the Old Testament saints. They also are resurrected at this point. And so this is all considered the first resurrection, okay? The first resurrection is just believers, church age, tribulation martyrs, and Old Testament saints. This is the first resurrection, and uh, verse 6, notice it says that those who take part in it are blessed and holy, and the second death has what? No power over them. What's the second death? The second death is the lake of fire. The eternal hell, that's what the second death is. And so all who take part in the first resurrection are not going to go there. I don't know what that is, but <clears throat> they're going to reign with Christ a thousand years. Now, this raises a question. If there's a first resurrection, there's got to be a second resurrection. At least that's the assumption here. In fact, that's what it says in Revelation chapter 20 as we keep reading. But let me just put up another diagram that I think will help make sense of this because I, don't, I, I, I really believe that it, it, it doesn't have to be too complicated, so sometimes visuals can help. So the first resurrection is for believers only. The second resurrection is for unbelievers. We're going to read about that in verse 11 to 15. The first resurrection is sometimes called the resurrection of the righteous. Okay? And there, if, you, if, you, if you look at this, um, there's three stages in the first resurrection. Stage one is the first fruits. This is seen in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, where the, the resurrection of Christ is spoken of as the first fruits. So just go, go, if you have a Bible, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. I want you to not just uh, see this, but read it. It says, Christ has been indeed raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So what's interesting is... In ancient Israel, when the harvest time was beginning, okay, so when the harvest was beginning, ready to get the harvest, 
um, what happened is the beginning, the first part of it was called the first fruits. And when the first stalks of grain were ripened, for example, the priest would go into the field, he'd take some of the ripe grain, and he'd bring it to the temple and it'd be offered as a, an offering. Leviticus 23 talks about this. It was an offering of first fruits, and it was more of a recognition that God is the one who provides it, that we thank God because of his provision. It is a little bit like our thanksgiving, right? You thank God in a special way for his blessings, uh, represented by a greater uh, amount of blessings. Now, when Jesus came out of the grave, he was the first fruits of the resurrection, meaning there's going to be more to come. You see, the first fruits was always a signal that the rest of the harvest was going to happen. It was just a matter of time. And so when Jesus rose again, his resurrection was the first of that kind. It was the first fruits. It was a recognition that the, there's going to be a, a greater harvest yet to come. And so that would be uh, stage two and stage three. Stage two of this greater harvest would be the uh, resurrection and translation of the church, the rapture, we call that. At the rapture, we are raised, uh, the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And that is the rapture, or the, if you want to call it here, the harvest. First Thessalonians 4. And then there's this other stage, which includes the tribulation martyrs and Old Testament saints. They are also raised in, up and given resurrected bodies before the millennium. Before the millennium, at the beginning of it. Now the second, so that's the first, uh, that's the first resurrection. And the second uh, resurrection, now that's just for believers. The second resurrection is for unbelievers. Unbelievers. And that is going to take place after the millennium, okay? After the thousand years, before the new heaven, the new earth, and we're going to read about that in a minute. So this just gives you a bit of an overview of the first resurrection, the second resurrection, and uh, some of the verses that are associated with it, and uh, I hope it'll be helpful just to kind of visually see it uh, for yourself. Then there's going to be a final rebellion at the end of the millennium, followed by a complete eradication of evil forever. Let's look at verse 7 and 9. When the thousand years are over, okay, so now thousand year reign over, Satan will be released from his prison. And he will go out to deceive the nations on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number they are like sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and sounded, surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire, burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So from what we can tell here, at the end of the millennium, God allows Satan to be released temporarily from that prison abyss. And when that happens, it isn't long before he, he gets up to his old self and deceives the nations one last final time. Now, this raises the question, now maybe you haven't thought about this, but a lot of people say, well, who are these people that rebel against Christ? Didn't, didn't you just say that, you know, the church is resurrected, we're given brand new glorified bodies, we can't sin anymore in those glorified bodies? Well, how are people going to rebel against Jesus? How does that make sense? Well, the answer is, everyone going into the millennium, you see, it is true, the, the church gets resurrected, the tribulation saints, the Old Testament saints, they're ruling and they're reigning with Christ, Right? But there's another group who have come through the tribulation. They're believers, but they're, they aren't given glorified bodies right away. And so they come through into the tribulation, they come through the tribulation, and they are on the earth during the millennium. Everyone going into the millennium, those people have, have non-glorified bodies. And they are living, they are, you know, saved. Everyone is saved at the beginning of it. But remember. With time, their children, they're going to be marriages and so on during the millennium. And the children are going to be, uh, uh, children will come along. And what's going to happen is the children 
won't necessarily follow in the faith of their parents. And so there's going to be some kind of generation at the end of the millennium that isn't saved, and they are the ones that are rebelling. Okay? So that, that's, in, in, in a sense, that's the only way to make sense of this millennium. Because who else, could, who else would rebel against Jesus? It has to be those who are not yet given the glorified bodies. And the only way that that's possible is they are ones who weren't part of the first resurrection because they uh, came through the tribulation on the earth. So that's just a little bit of theological stuff. Now, here we're going to see, though, uh, John mentions the enemies are given the names Gog and Magog. And if you know your Bible a little bit, it's the same names given in the book of Ezekiel, Gog and Magog. In fact, uh, I won't get into it now, but in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, it mentions um, an invasion, a force, uh, some nations that, that coalesce together and invade Israel. Now, it's my personal belief and understanding of the Bible that that's, that battle described in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is describing a battle that takes place during the tribulation. And it sets the stage for the rise of the Antichrist, I believe. However, some people do think that the Ezekiel 38 and 39 is describing at the end of the millennium what it's in, in, written here in Revelation 20. But there's, there's differences. There's serious differences. So just like the Battle of Armageddon, this battle is going to be over before it starts. Satan himself, his demons are set to be cast into the lake of fire or the burning sulfur. And the beast and the false prophet, you remember in Revelation 19, they were also thrown there uh, at the beginning of the millennium. And all of Satan's followers at that point will be killed and go to the realm of punishment awaiting their final sentence. All right, I know there's a lot to take in here, a lot to take in today. But let's just keep, keep looking at this passage, and I think it'll come around here. After the millennium, there is a final judgment for unbelievers, for unbelievers. Let's look at verses 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, that's the Lord. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, Another book was opened, which is the book of life. They were, the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death, there it tells us. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So sometimes the final judgment is called the great white throne judgment. You heard of that? And that's because here it's said to occur before the great white throne, which God is upon which the Lord is seated. The question is, who appears at this judgment? Well, I believe it's every unsaved person who has ever lived. They will be resurrected and appear before the great white throne judgment. In fact, notice it mentions in verse 13 that that the sea gave up her dead and and death in Hades, interestingly it says, uh, gave up their dead. Now that's important because the soul of every unbeliever who dies goes to a place of punishment called Hades. But that's not going to be their permanent. We talk about Hades, we talk about hell, Hades. It's not their permanent place, though. It says one day, all all of that will be uh, put in something called the lake of fire. And Hades, though, is the Greek word used in the New Testament to describe the realm that the unsaved go to when they die. And it's always referred in the Bible as a place of punishment. You can see Luke 16 as a reference for that. But it's, as I said, it's a temporary holding place until this resurrection and this great white throne judgment. And how will the unsaved be judged? This is important. Well, verse 12 says, notice books were opened. Books were opened. What books? Well, 
these books seem to be containing the, the, every, the record of every thought, every word, every deed. And notice in verse 12 it says, the, je- the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in those books. So Jesus will examine the deeds. And because they didn't trust in Jesus for a payment of their sins, they are, they are therefore judged according to what they've done. Because here's the thing. You see, God's justice demands payment for your sin and my sin. God's justice, because we, we talk about God's love, and God does love us. But because he loves us, he hates sin. <laughs> because God is holy, he hates sin, I should say. But God loves us, and, but you see, part of God's love for us and God's holiness, holiness requires that he also punish sin. And so, here's the thing. God's justice demands payment for every person's sin. And so, the minute we come to Christ, the minute we turn from our sin, turn to Jesus, and we accept Jesus as our Savior, God's, the demand of punishment upon us is relieved. It says that we are justified. We are, we're no longer guilty. Why? Because the punishment fell on Jesus. That's what the gospel tells us, that Jesus took our punishment. Jesus took God's wrath upon himself so that you and I wouldn't have to pay for it. And, and, and so, but sadly, those who don't accept Jesus and his gift of salvation will discover that because they didn't accept the payment of Christ for their sin, they must pay for their sin. And because sin is, all sin is against an eternal God, all sin will have to be suffered and paid for eternally. Okay? And so that is why this punishment is taking place. Now, it also means that there will be different degrees of punishment in hell. It will be worse for those who have done more evil and caused more suffering and harm to others. Remember, Jesus even talked about it. He talked about, it'll be better, you know, woe to you, uh, Capernaum, it'll be more tolerable for you. Than, and he, so there's different degrees of punishment. But notice this other book that's mentioned. You see it says there in verse 12, the book of life. The book of life of life. What's the book of life? Well, it was referred to previously in Revelation three times. Chapter 3, verse 5, chapter 13, verse 8, and chapter 17, verse 8. It is also known as the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb's book of life. And so it contains the names of every child of God, every person who has accepted accepted God's gift of salvation by faith. And it includes the names of all those who have ever lived who have accepted God's gracious offer of salvation, which is fulfilled and given to us through what Jesus did on the cross. And that is the book of life. And and, because notice it says, if anyone's name was not found, verse 15, written in the book of life, they were thrown into the lake of fire. Well, all unbelievers, their names are not in the book of life. And so that, that, that terif- that's terrifying, but that is the reality, it says here. Now, the lake of fire, as I said, is, is really the name for eternal hell. And a lot of times, you know, in, in recent years, it's interesting, I was just, you know, searching a few things on- online, and I, I came across sort of a, what seems to be a growing debate uh, in, even in evangelical um, circles, about whether hell is eternal or not. And there seems to be some debate, and, and, and um, I, I don't know, because it's, you know, it's sometimes Christians say, well, it's just a figure of speech, and it really means annihilation, and um, unsaved or just sort of incinerated or annihilated, um, simply cease to exist. But, but that, doesn't hold, that doesn't really hold weight with the Scriptures. Because let me, let me show you a verse that I think would make it clear. Matthew 25, verse 46 says that Jesus said, Then they, the unrighteous, will go away to eternal punishment, but all the righteous to eternal life. You see that? 
in the Greek language, the original language of the New Testament, the same word for eternal is used in both clauses. So if eternal life for, for believers in Christ is unending, which it is, then it stands to reason that eternal punishment must also be eternal and unending. You can't accept the fact that it, life, there's eternal life that goes on and on and on and then reject that the eternal punishment is not a reality. They're either both true or they're not true. And so, because we know that eternal life is eternal, it must therefore follow that eternal punishment is also eternal. And so, I see no reason to reject the traditional view of hell, the biblical view, in fact, and to try and uh, explain around it that it's talking about annihilation and something else. No, it's talking about a real place where there is suffering, where there is a emotional suffering, physical agony, spiritual agony, and where, there, where people are separated, where, where actually not just their souls, but we're talking, there's a resurrection, you notice? There, there, there's a resurrection. If we go back, it says that they are resurrected. They're judged. And so these dead are standing before him, and there's, this is the great white throne judgment. And so as we look at this, that is incredibly terrifying to think of, and yet at the same time as we look at it, we can see the incredible riches of God's grace because he's provided for us a way to escape that judgment through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? As the most famous verse of the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, as Jesus, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting, eternal life. And so God has provided a way that our sins can be paid for, and those who reject God's payment uh, of Jesus will then have to pay for it themselves. But you see... You and I have this incredible opportunity uh, in knowing this to really make our trust and know that our trust is in Jesus. There's only one way to escape, a, uh, escape this terrifying reality of hell, and that is to trust Jesus and the gift of eternal life that he offers. And so, is your name in the book of life? You know, church attendance won't put it there. Uh, in, you know, taking communion won't put it there each month. Even getting baptized won't put your name there. Your, your best efforts, your morality won't put your name there. It's not by doing things like that. It's only trusting in Jesus and what he's done. That is how our name is written in the book of life. And so that is incredible, isn't it? That God actually offers, that the God of the universe, think about it, the God of the universe who created all things, that he would, he would think of you, he would think of me, that he would provide a way that we can enjoy eternal life and our sins could be dealt with. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that tell us how much God loves us? In fact, one of my verses I love so much is in Romans chapter 2 at verse 4, and it says, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not, it's not the fear of God's punishment that leads to repentance, though the fear of punishment can wake us up, but it says it's his kindness that leads to repentance. When you see how kind God is, when you see how loving he is, when you see how, uh, how much he's done for you, then you say, God, I surrender all. I trust in your son Jesus who paid for my sin. I want to live for you. I want to be uh, yours. I want to let my life count. I want to tell others about your kindness. You see, that's the, that's the kind of response that God wants us to have. Not just to fear his judgment, but to say, God, you're so kind, you're so loving, you're so incredible and merciful to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Have you come to God like that? Have you, have you, have you had that response yet to him in your life? Well, if you haven't, if you haven't, then you can today. You can come to God like that, thanking him for his, his gift of salvation and, and, and accept, not just thanking him, but accepting it. 
I was explaining to someone this week that, you know, to receive Christ is essentially to accept Jesus and believe in his name. But it's, it's like accepting a gift. If somebody gives you a gift and puts it in front of you, it does you no good unless you take it, right? Unless you open it up. And in fact, I think somebody, if, if somebody gave you a gift, uh, you know, if I gave someone a gift and, and they just sort of put it there and, 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 and put it down, I, I, I might be a little bit insulted, right? I mean, if you, you put all this effort into choosing something for them, you prepared it, you wrapped it, and you give it to them, and they say, oh, thank you for the gift. It, 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 it's great. Thank you. But then they don't take it and open it? That would be a little bit insulting, right? It would maybe be hurtful if you really love them so much. Well, imagine God. He's, he's given us this beautiful gift of salvation. He puts it in front of us. And, and then some people say, well, that, that's, thank you, but no thanks. I don't need that. Maybe later. Maybe I'll just want to live my life right now. I want to, want to do what I want. I don't really want to do what you want. And, and I'll just maybe put that gift aside. But we don't know how, how long we have. We don't know if we're here tomorrow. You see, the Bible says now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. And so God wants you to accept that gift today if you haven't. God wants you to say, Jesus, be my Savior. Be my God. Be my Lord. Save me. And if you've never done that, you can today. And I just invite you to close your eyes, bow your heads with me as we pray. In fact, I just feel led to give anyone an opportunity listening to me Listening to this, just to settle the matter of salvation, all you need to do is, is call on Jesus in prayer, in faith. He's only a prayer way. No matter how far away you've gotten with God, you're only one prayer away to get back. And so if you want to say a prayer like this in your heart to settle the matter, make sure your name is written in that book of life. You can say, Dear Jesus, just repeat that after me if you want in your heart. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I believe you died and rose again to pay the penalty for my sin. I receive you as my Lord and Savior right now. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you for your kindness that leads me to salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you prayed something like that for the first time, or maybe you're watching online, tell somebody. Tell me. Tell somebody around you, and I'd love to hear from you. And if you need support, uh, what's what we're here for? We're here to help you grow. And I hope that you will also um, share this message, the message of salvation with others, as you have opportunity. You know, sometimes what you can pray is to say, God, give me an opportunity this week Give me an opportunity with people around me. And you know what I find is when I pray that, uh, often I have an encounter with someone. Maybe I go and i got to bring my car into the mechanic and I get talking, oh, you know, and, and, and there's an opportunity. Or maybe there's uh, somebody at the grocery store. I, you know, sometimes if you pray and say, God, give me an opportunity, uh, uh, more, more often than not, you know, he, he'll give you that opportunity. So may God bless you. May you each go in the power of the Holy Spirit. As it, and let me just share the benediction. It's from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. It says, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day, now, and forever. Amen.